Good morning, Genesis. It's wonderful to see you all this morning. My name is Sarah. I'm one of the worship leaders here. We are so pumped to be able to sing, pray, hear the word together this morning, especially since we get one more Sunday before Christmas Eve of Christmas music. We're very excited. I wanted to invite anyone who's out in the open space to make your way into the sanctuary. Grab some coffee on your way in. If you're in the sanctuary, why don't we all stand as we begin by singing, O Come All Ye Faithful.
As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. the story of Jesus. And if you know it, please um, please join us in singing. But if you don't, I, I want to invite you to let this just wash over you and allow the Lord to speak to you through this. We're going to continue talking about Jesus, what Jesus has done for us. And I want us to take this time to just fix our eyes on him because we're all coming in with all sorts of things on our mind, things that um, can distract us, um, especially as we're entering into Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. This song has helped me to refocus on who we're worshiping. So let's sing this together. 
Jesus, what a joy it is to reflect on your story. Lord, I thank you for this Christmas season. We get to really focus in on the incarnation. We get to allow the, the beauty to infiltrate our hearts. Lord, I pray that that would be true this morning. That as we hear more of the story of Jesus, God made flesh come to rescue us, to save us. Lord, speak to us. Thank you for Kendall and the time that he has invested in and poured into and all the love that he has poured into studying your word this week, to listening to you. Lord, would you bless the words as they come from him. Thank you for giving him the things that you want him to say. Lord, would you prepare our hearts to hear? God, we love you. We expect to hear from you, to see you, to be transformed by you this morning. We pray all this in your beautiful and wonderful name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, Genesis, how are you? Merry Christmas. So, in light of that, I want to share with you one of my favorite Christmas passages. Is that okay? Yeah. It's not really a normal Christmas passage. You won't find this on any nice holiday greeting cards, but I think it totally captures the spirit and the heart of Christmas. So, it's 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29, and it says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Now, this verse is totally a Christmas verse in my head, at least, because this is just how Jesus came. Jesus came and adopted a lowly position in order to rescue and redeem lowly people. And this teaches me that God does unimaginable things to bring people into his story. That God is the God of the unimaginable. That God does things that we would have never expected, things we would have never written. If someone asked us to write a novel about how God visits the planet, we would have never written it the way that it was written. I mean, let's look at Matthew chapter 1, which is where the nativity story begins. We see Jesus showing up not at the city of Rome, which was the center of power. We see Jesus not showing up with 10 billion chariots filled with heaven's armies. No, we see him coming as a defenseless child in a small town village, born into abject poverty, so that very few people would have actually met him or noticed him. 
It's unimaginable the way the king of the universe entered our planet. It's unimaginable. We see an unwed teenage virgin who gets the, the privilege of being his mom. We see her, him conceived by the Holy Spirit. And we see his stepdad, who's going to play father in his life, has to come to terms with all of this data from a dream. And that's just chapter 1. Look at Luke. Luke chapter 1 tells us even more unimaginable things about how this happened. It says that the angel Gabriel, it's one of the most powerful angels in heaven, he comes and he comes to deliver the message in Nazareth. That's like where I grew up. There's a phrase back in Jesus' time that says, what good could come from Nazareth? I'm from Moxville, North Carolina. Can anything good come from there? One thing that we did, that we won at, kind of, is we were voted the number two most redneck town in all of North Carolina. <laughs> we didn't get number one because we don't win at anything. <laughs> what good can come from a place like that? It's to a town like that that Jesus came. It's to a town like that that the angel bore the good news. Think about this, Elizabeth, Mary's relative. Gabriel not only announces the miraculous birth to Mary, he announces the miraculous birth to Elizabeth. She wasn't too young. She was far too old. Long past the age of childbearing, long past menopause, this woman gets this announcement that she's going to bear a son who's going to usher in and let people know that the Messiah has come. This is John the Baptist's mom. God's doing unimaginable things in this story. Think about this. The Roman government issues a tax decree, and it's because of that tax decree that Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Did you know hundreds of years before Jesus came, it was prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem? And it wasn't Joseph late one night researching because, oh my goodness, the, the angel told me that my future wife's going to have a baby. I need to figure out where he's going to be born. I'm going to figure out how to raise him, what to feed him. It was none of that. It was a Roman Empire who was greedy and hungry to punish the people, issuing this decree to get them to go to their hometown. And it was because of that that the prophecy was fulfilled. That tells me there is no government that God's not sovereign over. We had a partial government shutdown. God's still in control. We have an interesting president. God's still in control. God's sovereign over the affairs of men. God is in control. And he does unimaginable things. We find out in this passage that the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, is born in an animal stable. We find out that the Lord of all creation, the one who authored all of it and created it, lied feebly in a feeding trough made for pigs. We find out that the one who wore heaven's robes, the royal robes, was wrapped in cloths of linen, shabby, tightly, uh, wrapped cloth. And can we just see how unimaginable all of this is? Nothing about this story is predictable. Nothing about it is the way that we would have thought. And that just tells me that God works in unimaginable ways. God does the unimaginable. So if you will, turn with me to Luke chapter 2, where we're going to explore one more instance of God doing the unimaginable. We're going to be talking about the shepherds and how God moves in their life and what that means for all of us here today, and it's good news. So turn with me to Luke chapter 2 as we look at this God who does unimaginable things. It says, in the same region, there were shepherds who were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flocks. Now, right off the bat, we learn from this passage that God chooses unimaginable people to be a part of his story. And if we've been tracking so far with the way this goes, we see that God chooses virgins to have children. We see that God chooses elderly women to have children. We see that God does all of these unimaginable things. So it shouldn't be surprising that he chooses to reveal it to shepherds. But what I want to press home is, is that that's for us too. When we open up the Bible and we look at it, we have a tendency at times to say, that was them, but that's not me. We somehow believe that we can out -sin the grace of God. We somehow believe that we can outrun the God who can chase us down and find us. He went from heaven and came to Bethlehem to find us. See, this passage tells me that we who are unimaginable can be brought into God's story. Isn't that good news? God chooses unimaginable people 
to be in his story so that none of us will ever believe that we're too far gone for God. The news about the birth of his one and only son did not come to kings. It was not donned in palaces. It was not told to powerful men. It was not told to religious leaders. It was told to the most unimaginable, unlikely people. And God uses unimaginable means to get them to understand that story. Look at what it says. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. One of the most predictable jobs in the ancient world was a shepherd. You wake up, you do the sheep stuff. You wake up, you do the sheep stuff. You go to sleep, wake up, go to sleep, wake up. It's predictable. Every day of your life, you know what you're going to get. Except this night, when the sky exploded. Except this night, when it kind of like an atomic bomb went off in their backyard, and they're they're getting out of their sleeping bag in full-on panic mode. And I love what the angel says to them. Don't be afraid. Really? Don't be afraid? How can you possibly make that claim? Because I bring good news. This teaches me that God not only uses unimaginable people, and brings them into his story, that God also moves in unimaginable ways to show us his glory. God wants us to understand him. God wants us to know him. But look, the angels have to deal deal with something first, and that's their fear. And you may be like, why were they afraid? Isn't God good, and isn't he loving? Well, yeah. But the most natural reaction a natural man can have when coming into the supernatural power of God is fear. And I'd like to show you what that means right now. It would be like us trying to stand on the face of Jupiter, which I know we can't do. The gravitational pull would compound us and would crush us. Or better yet, it's like these shepherds where God turns up the dial for a moment. All of us believe that gravity is a good thing. When I go home and I get sleepy and I take a nap, I'm not gonna wake up in the atmosphere Praise God for that. That'd be weird. So gravity's good, but if you turn it up, it's crushing. God's presence is good, but when you experience more than your physicality can handle, it would be crushing. It's it's coming to these men, and it's pressing down upon them, and it's crushing them. But it doesn't crush them. Remember that doesn't crush them. Just know that God moves in unimaginable ways to show people his glory. And this is not the first time that this has happened. In the Old Testament, there's this man named Isaiah. He's a prophet, and he was sent to be a prophet to the people of Israel. And thankfully, he wrote down in his journal, which we now call the book of Isaiah, what it was like when he encountered the holiness of God. This is what he says. Woe is me. Not the most uh, thrilling line that you've probably ever read. Not what you would have expected. He says, woe is me for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips and I'm living among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen something that they were not prepared to see. I've seen the king. I've seen the Lord of armies. Isaiah is calling out curses on himself because God is so good he can't handle it. God is so perfect and so unimaginably holy, it is ripping Isaiah apart. It would be like, I asked a scientist friend of mine to explain this to me, so it still kind of makes sense to me, but I hope that it shows the point. It would be like us or Isaiah stepping into a particle accelerator. A particle accelerator does what it says. It accelerates particles, okay? And this is what she said. She said, the electromagnetic force would be so strong that it would compromise every molecular bond in your body, would denature your enzymes, unravel your DNA, destroy the lipid bilayers, basically disrupting the homeostatic balance beyond what your body could handle, causing you to perish. (laughs) Wow. That's what people feel like, though, when they come into the presence of God. God moves in unimaginable ways, show people his glory. 
And you may be wondering, why is glory so dangerous? Why is it so hard for us to be in God's presence? I think there's two reasons for that. Number one, I think our sin is much worse than we think it is. I think that our sin is so unimaginably offensive to God, we can't even be in his presence. That's number one. I think number two, that God is so infinitely, unimaginably better than we give him credit for, so infinitely good, we can't even be near him because his presence would overwhelm us. So here you have an infinitely good God. Here you have us who are in sin and we have fallen. How do we have relationship with God? What I want us to see here, though, is that none of these were consumed. None of them were overwhelmed. God came and God did not overwhelm them. Look at what Israel, what happens to them. When the people saw the glory of God come down on Mount Sinai, it says that they trembled and they stood at a distance and they told Moses, you speak to us and we're going to listen, but don't let God speak to us because if he does, we'll die. (laughs) But they didn't die. That's what the good news is. That's because God had a different purpose for showing them his glory. They were... Wicked enough that God's glory could have consumed them, but it didn't. And that's because God had a different purpose. God uses unimaginable ways to show people his glory. Look at what my friend John Calvin says. I modified this and updated it so it's readable for us today. So if there's any Calvin scholars, I didn't change the truth. Just updated it. For the majesty of God would swallow up the entire world. If it were not for something holding it back, holding back the terror which it brings, and rightly the sinner falls down lifeless at the sight of God because God appears to them in no other character than that of a righteous judge. But, but, to revive the minds of the shepherds, the angel declares that he was sent to them for a different purpose. He was sent to them for a different purpose, to announce to them the mercy of God. And when men hear this single word that God has reconciled to them, it not only raises up those who are fallen down, it not only restores those who are ruined, but it recalls them from death to life. See, God is doing the unimaginable in them, and he's doing the unimaginable in you to bring unimaginable people into relationship with him. And he does that through Jesus Christ alone. There is no other way to be in relationship with the Father. There is no other way to have an infinite holy God love infinitely wicked creatures but through Jesus Christ alone. Without Jesus Christ, these men had every reason to be afraid. But the angel says, don't fear because look, I proclaim to you good news. What's the good news? What is the good news? What is the gospel? It's that your sin doesn't have to have the final word. It's that God's presence is no longer has to be dangerous to you. It's that you can have a relationship with God through Christ. When the angels speak, they say that you don't have to fear. Why? Because Jesus Christ is here. That's the only reason that they don't have to be afraid. That's the only thing protecting him. And that is good news, not just for the shepherds. That is good news for us. Today, God has made a way for you to know him through Jesus Christ. He's given you a way to avoid his wrath, to avoid the punishment that all of us deserve, and he's given us that way through Christ and Christ alone. And listen, I'm going to say it starkly, but we are not good enough to save ourselves. We're not. And God is too good to overlook our sin. So if we don't have Christ, we don't have anything. That's the only thing that brings us into the presence of God. He's the good news the angel is talking about. He's the great joy that the angels are talking about. But if you're not in Christ today, if you you are not sure you're a Christian, you are standing on shaky ground and it cannot support you. It cannot hold you. You're trying to enter into the presence of God as someone who is not qualified to do so without Christ. It would be like trying to fly to the sun. The sun is wonderful. The sun is awesome. The sun is amazing. It gives life. It it makes flowers grow. It makes us warm. But if you get too close to it, it will consume you. It's good. 
but you can't get close enough to it to touch it. That is, here, unless you are in the Son of God. If you're in Christ, you can get close to the Father. If you're in Christ, you can have a relationship with the Father. You have to be in Christ. Don't presume on his mercy. It could be that you're here today, that you are here today because God has been holding back his glory, graciously waiting on you, graciously and lovingly holding it back so that you can come to know him. And please don't put it off because we are not promised tomorrow. One drunk driver and it's over. We have a lot of confidence in the road. We live in New England. I think I'm going to die every time I drive. I mean, it is, it, is, it is more important here that you understand this. We may not be in the fields today. We may not be out there with the shepherds, but I, I tell you this, if, if God ripped the roof off this building right now and a host of angels came, the glory of the Lord was pressing down upon us, the only thing that would keep us safe is Christ. He's the only thing we can hide ourselves in. So if you are not in Christ today, please, I will be here after service. I'll stay as long as it takes. I will talk with you. I will pray with you. I will explain the gospel to you. There's other people in this room who would love to do it, but please do not leave until you know Christ. But for those who know Christ, fear not. Fear not. Because you've been clothed with Christ. God has done the unimaginable in your life. And he's brought you the good news of salvation. And because of that good news, you can have great joy. But there's one more thing you can have. See, God expects not only to bring unimaginable people in his story. God not only protects us from his glory. God expects us to share the story. God expects us to share it. Look at what the text says. Don't be afraid for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for who? All the people. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and let's see what's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they hurried off. And they found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And after seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about this child. And everyone who heard it was amazed by it. This teaches me that when they came into an encounter with the living Christ, and they didn't even see the fullness of it. They just saw him lying in a manger. But when they came into contact, they immediately responded. They joyfully responded. And they told everyone they knew about it. Now, look, I've got to repent here, too, because I don't live this way. But this is what this message of hope is, is teaching all of us here today, is that we don't have to live predictably. We don't have to treat the gospel as an every day. It's just another day type of thing. We can live out the unimagined. God has done the unimaginable in you so that he can showcase the unimaginable through you to all the people who do not know him. And it's too important not to because hell is real and hot and we have the remedy. But we don't do it out of duty. We do it out of delight. We do it because of the goodness of God and what he's done for us. These men were encouraged not because of a fireworks show. These men were encouraged because God spared them and God delivered them and God saved them and they got to tell everyone. It's not a have to, it's a I get to. Again, God does the unimaginable in you to showcase that through you. So in closing, if you're not in Christ, talk to someone today, code me Christ. It is exactly the only thing that you need. It's the only thing keeping you safe. If you're a Christian, make that phone call that you've been wanting to make. Send that email that you've been wanting to send. Go visit that person you've been wanting to visit. Send a text message. Send a Facebook message. I don't know what Snapchat is, but do that. <laughs> There's some person in your life that God has been laying on your heart. And the only thing between them and hell is the message of the gospel. And he has qualified you because if he could qualify shepherds, he can qualify anyone. And that's not a slam on shepherds. 
God chooses unlikely people. That's us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for what you've done. Lord, thank you for the fact that you have chosen to use us. God, I can't speak for everyone here, but I, I know who I am. I know how unlikely that is. And Lord, it's just sheer grace. Lord, let the good news of our salvation be great joy. Lord, let a depressed Christian not be a reality. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move in this room. And if there's been someone who's been struggling with anxiety, or someone who's been struggling with fear, or someone who's been struggling with depression, if the in-laws are frustrating them, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would give them great joy because great joy is possible based on what you did. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here who's not in Christ, that the enemy would not come in and try to sow uh, weeds in it, that they would not put, try to plant them in, in rocky ground. Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would give them the courage necessary to make a decision for Christ. Lord, let it not be so that embarrassment or shyness or anything else keeps someone from entering into the kingdom of God today. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give courage where courage is needed, and I pray that you would redeem uh, that person in here who needs to come to Christ. Lord, I pray that in your name, in, in your power, in your blood, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we just heard, the good news of Christmas only makes sense in light of the bad news, which was we needed to be saved, we needed to be redeemed, we needed to be set free from sin and death. And as we continue in worship, we're going to take communion. And communion is for those who believe who are followers of Jesus Christ. And it's the time that you enjoy freedom. It's the time you enjoy grace. It's the time you enjoy mercy extended to you through the broken body of Christ and spilled blood. And if you're not a Christian today, uh, maybe it's a time to pray. Maybe it's a time to find someone to talk to, someone, as Kendall mentioned, and to start asking those questions. Why are so many people here to sing when I'm not sure why they're singing? Why are they here to praise when I don't quite get it? Uh, now is an opportunity to ask them to hear the gospel and experience the gospel and forever be changed because of it. And then we'll come back and we're going to sing this song about the incarnation of Christ coming for us because we are his. And we can enjoy that freedom. So let's continue our time of worship.
world waits for a miracle. The heart longs for a little bit of hope. Oh, come. Oh, come, Emmanuel. The child prays for peace on earth, and she's calling out from the sea of bird. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And can Before we close in prayer, I just wanted to invite you to let you know of the opportunity that before you leave here, uh, you have the opportunity just to respond what God's been doing uh, specifically in this moment with you. If you're here and you've not yet made that decision to say, Jesus, I know you love me uh, and I want to respond to that today in a way that I never have before. I've just asked our prayer team to stick around for a bit. They'll be up at, towards the front of the room on my left and right, and they would love to pray with you. If you have questions about faith, about Christ, and how to know God, they would love to talk with you and pray with you. But maybe you also have someone in your life that has no idea who God is and his love for them. I would invite you to stick around and say, hey, can we just pray together for my mom or my dad or my brother or my sister or one of my kids or one of my friends, neighbors, coworkers, or classmates? 
but this is the season where we have the opportunity not only to respond to God's work and invitation in our life, but also to pray for those that God would work in their lives as well and that we could be part of that. So God, thank you for who you are, that you are a God who is righteous and just and holy, a God who is just beautiful. And God, we give thanks that we have the opportunity to know who you are because of Christ and Christ alone. God, I give thanks that you have invited every single person here to walk in friendship and relationship with you. And God, I give thanks that the good news was not get our lives straight, be religious or moral or perfect or pious. But God, the invitation, the good news is that you send Christ so that we could know you through his life, his perfect sinless life, that we could know you because he went to the cross and paid the penalty for our sins. And God, we could know you because death could not hold Christ. He was resurrected to life, and because of that, we have life as well. So Christmas, God, we remember and we celebrate that Christ came so that we could know God the Father both now and throughout eternity. God, we pray for our friends that have no idea, God, how you feel about them. God, that you love them and care about them and want to know them. So God, I pray that literally in the next 36 hours, if there is someone that we should call or someone that we should invite, someone that we should proclaim the good news to, God, I pray that we would not hold back from doing that. So God, thank you for your goodness and thanks for allowing us to be part of the most amazing relationship we could ever have, a relationship with the creator of the universe. Thanks for making a way. We give thanks and pray that Jesus your name. Amen. Hey, before you leave, uh, I wanted to let you know of two things. In 2019, we are beginning uh, our year uh, in prayer. We're taking the first 21 days uh, to pray. We didn't want to make a resolution. We want to say, God, we want to come to you in prayer. But what we're doing in prayer is we want to do something a little bit different. And so we made the decision that we're going to cover every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day for 21 days in prayer. Now, if you do the math on that, uh, we broke the day up into 20-minute time slots and asked people, hey, would you sign up for a 20-minute time slot? Whether you just do it once in the 21 days or just do it multiple times in the 21 days. So if the math on that's a little bit over 1,500 time slots would needed to be filled to cover every moment of the 21 days. As of today, uh, we're about 1,350 time slots have been taken. Uh, which is awesome. That's about 91, 92% uh, of the 100% were almost there, which means there's a little bit of about 140-ish time slots that are still available. So if you haven't signed up for a 20-minute time slot or a few 20-minute time slots, please do that today. You can stop by the living room. You can go to this bit.ly link, bit.ly uh, backslash prayer 21 to sign up for that. But don't miss being part of what God's going to do with not just you, but a church that's going to pray Uh, for every second of every minute of every hour of every day for 21 days. And then second, we're going to gather tomorrow night at two different times, 5.30 p.m. and then 7 p.m. I hope you can come back, but our hope is that you would invite someone to join you, Uh, that family member, that friend, neighbor, coworker, classmate. Uh, I promise you they are probably thinking about what they might do for Christmas Eve, and they just need an invitation Uh, to go somewhere, and I'd love for you to invite them to come with you. We'll see you hopefully tomorrow night with a lot of your friends and family, 5.30 and 7 p.m. God bless. Peace out.